my first interest in model railways, I suppose, was way back in 1958 when I was bought my first train set, like nearly all of us. Um, a Christmas present, I think it was, uh, my father brought me at Marklin and it had three rails, I didn't like it, went straight back, managed to swap it for a Hornby Doubler, two rails, so I was happy then. I've always been practical, one of the family, you know, I, I actually did a loft conversion without my parents knowing. Uh, <laughs> it's only when my foot came through the ceiling over their bed that they got an inkling. I never did metal work at school, so I didn't know whether I was good at metal work or not until that, actually after I left school. And then um, I just went to evening class for a little bit of entertainment on uh, using a lathe and what have you and found that loved it and it clicked straight away and I thought god I've wasted all this time I could have been uh, making things out of metal. I was quite uh, quite friendly with a chap called John Boyle, Decent Models in Cheltenham, he worked for GCHQ there and he did the most exquisite coach kit designs with all the um, detail inside of all the shell uh, brackets, all its lovely wrought iron work and what have you and I was fascinated by this and I thought well I could have a go at that. And, um, he told me the sort of rudimentaries of it, and um, I, the first kit I ever designed was actually a signal box kit. Some of you might remember the um, on the Churchill Models range, and I did a Great Western signal box with a hip roof and a gable roof and a Midland box. Uh, but the first etching I ever did was sets of window frames for Great Western signal boxes, and that was 1981. Um, and then. My first loco kit I did was the 45 class, um, and that was back in 1984, um, uh, under the Churchill Models banner. What I try to do with the kits is to make them as self-jigging as possible. In other words, lots of slots and tabs, substructures, which you clothe with the detail afterwards. Um, like, for instance, a tank engine like this. Um, this is the 517, this was the test etch that I actually built to make sure the kit went together and um, luckily it did. <laughs> and it was, I also thought about the assembly, most of the solder joints are from the inside therefore you don't get solder all over the outside which is a nice important thing, especially photographing it for adverts and things like that, you want it to look its best. Um, but it's basically two substructures, if you look inside there's a cage at the front and a cage at the back and it is literally clothed with the riveting detail and there's holes inside where you can just spot solder to hold in it. You don't need to flood it with solder. The one thing you never want to use either is a, is a blow lamp. They're designed to be put together with 145 degree melt solder which flows very easily from quite a low temperature iron because one thing etch kits do not like is high temperature. That's when you get stretching, bubbling, messy models. The other thing that uh, frightens people about building an etch kit for the first time is the inevitable job that you have to do of rolling the boiler. Um, it's fairly straightforward actually and a lot of people say oh it, isn't it difficult to roll a taper boiler do I need special taper rollers? Well no of course you don't because it's the shape of the actual material that dictates whether it's going to be a taper shape or parallel shape. Um, but what is worth doing is to get yourself a pair of decent rolling bars. Um, these ones were made by Cherry Models some years ago. There are um, a lot on the market now. Um, have a look around Gildex. Let's have a go at rolling this boiler now. I've already cut it out from the etch as you can see. I just used a pair of sharp decent craft scissors and filed up the edge just to clean it up. I always put a piece of thin card underneath the material to be rolled because any detail like rivets and boiler bands can be flattened through the bars like a rolling mill in the steelworks. So you use a bit of card, the thickness of the detail that you're protecting so it can penetrate if it's a rivet into there without coming to any harm. So face down into the roller, wind it through and just feel so it's lightly pinching the material and past the first. What I do with the table boiler usually is turn it round and come in from both sides. So, because by the shape it can go a bit corkscrewy if you don't watch that. Once you've got the initial curve started, you can bring up the rear bar, this third roller at the back that pushes it up to form the curve 
and you'll see straight away that the, the curve is getting more pronounced. Take it a little bit at a time, don't try to do too much in one go, otherwise you'll start kinking the material. And especially work on those, those ends. Coming around there. Oh, there's your boiler, ready to solder together. If that isn't flat enough there for a solder joint, you can put it over a piece of bar in the vise and with a soft rubber mallet just give it a little tap along the edge just to give a, a flat edge at the bottom. Tack solder at either side and use a strip of spare material off the side of the etch as a strengthener on the top and solder it all up nice and solid leaving a little bit of room either side of course for the rings that go in for joining the smoke box and the fire box. And there we have it, it's as easy as that. Now that we've finished with the boiler, the next job is to have a look at the firebox. Um, the firebox is a little bit more tricky. You don't use the rolling bars on this, although I do just run it through lightly just to give a gentle curve over the whole firebox etch itself because the crown actually has a small radius on the top. Um, you've got the front and back templates etched in the kit, um, most kits have got that to give you the exact shape. But if you remember, I said on mine, I put the two little pointers front and back, which if you join them with a pencil, um, you'll find they'll run through the holes where the mud hole covers are as well. And that gives you the center line for the radius of the top of the firebox. And the forming bar I use, just a bit of brass, I've made this line hefty so you can see it, just draw a fine black line down the center so that when you put it in the vise, you can lay that firebox with the two pointers lining up perfectly with the line and make your fold. It's as easy as that. The larger radius is on the side. You can see here the remains of the line down there. We've got quite a large curvature there and that's a simple matter of laying on a piece of rubber and using say a half inch bar and just rolling like a rolling pin and you'll find that comes around very easily. Use the formers and keep checking. And again the reverse curve at the bottom that brings it down to the foot plate. Again a piece of bar on the outside, fold it over and gently coax it into place using your thumb or a piece of softwood, something like that. But use the formers always to check your work as you go along. If you find you put this curve in the wrong place don't worry, you can move it backwards and forwards by moving the bar slightly to one side and pulling down the side or pulling across the top. You'll find that that radius can move without showing a kink. And that's the firebox. I've always got a lot of work going on and laid out in front of me here are a few of the locos under the various stages of construction. It's a good opportunity to see the various uh, jobs that need to be done. Here, right at the beginning of the the row is the basic footplate etch and the basic chassis. Very important to get that chassis absolutely dead square. I always build it on a surface plate, but a piece of plate glass is just as well. It, uh, as long as it's absolutely flat and there's no twist in it, because uh, it's the foundation of the whole locomotive. Next stage, we've rolled the boilers, you've already, you've already seen, and the basic footplate with the overlays going on now with all the rivet detail. Next one along, we've got the chassis constructed, the wheels on, just loosely at the moment. They haven't had their balance weights on or anything like that. The chassis painted and the little adjusters on the axle boxes we can set now to get the chassis absolutely level. I've already painted and finished off the front part of this King locomotive, which has got all the working valve gear already in place and tested to make sure it's okay. Next stage, the finished chassis with the cylinders and gubbins all attached, valve rods, inside motion, all connected up with the motor and tested. It's a good time to test the chassis actually on curves and what have you to make sure there's no shorting. It's much easier to see it without the body on. And onto the actual bodywork. This one's just come back from the painters, single chimney king class, ready for its final detailing, the back head, glazing, number plates, name plates, and buffers, etc. And finally, a finished king here, which is a double chimney BR king, 
um, complete with the root indicator on the front of the smoke box. Smoke box number plate, of course, BR, no buffer beam plate. All finished off, all cab detail, even down to the windscreen wipers on the uh, on the on the spectacle plate windows there. All the oilers, main plates, and everything. All it needs is its tender now, fully cold up, and uh, test again on preferably a, a good crossover with a reverse curve so that we make sure that wheels, pony trucks and uh, tender wheels don't cause any shorts by um, the angle that the tender makes with the locomotive itself.